Hello, hello. Here we are back again for another episode of The Music of Middle Earth. Episode 7, time to talk about our beloved Shire. I'm your host, Jordan Rennells. I'm a teacher and musician, and I'm going to give you a bit of a guided tour through Howard Shore's music for the film adaptations of J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings from Peter Jackson. Last episode, we got to talk about the hobbits, their ways, and where they came from. And this episode, we get to talk about their home, sweet home. The real warmth and feeling of home that the Shire brings comes out so clearly from this beautiful and uplifting theme. Now, as you know, we're going through each of the themes that Howard Shore wrote for these incredible movies. There are over a hundred to check out, so we have quite a few more to go. Um, But music is such an important aspect of Tolkien's world. Music is how his world is created through harmony and and song and discord. I'm really excited to be able to have this opportunity to go back through all the material, to explore newer material like the history of Middle Earth books, and just to get an even deeper appreciation for the professor's work and, and the great work that continues to go on on his behalf. So we're on the second episode of our collection of 11 episodes for the Shire. Now, as I mentioned in the last episode, these themes are all aspects of the bigger Shire piece, or song, if you want to call it that, that we know as Concerning Hobbits. There's so much to talk about with each bit of it, though, so we have to do an episode for each. This episode actually has a fun little bonus for you all as well. A good friend and teacher that I work with, Sophie Dupuis, uh, who's an incredible violinist, will be playing most every version of the theme and its variations for us this time. So you'll get to hear a real violin instead of my interpretation of it. Very excited about that. We won't get to have it in every episode, but it's definitely really great to get people on now and then so that we can hear some real instruments. Let's start off by taking a listen to Sophie play this rural setting theme. So this theme we hear right after the pensive setting in that opening sequence in the Shire. It takes that homely, warm, melancholy feel that the pensive setting has, and it ramps it up into this higher energy. This is where these wonderful hobbits live. We see them bustling about their business and tucked away in their lovely home. It's such a great way to introduce us to this world. Now, as always in the words of Tom Bombadil, time to dig deep. In Doug Adams' book, The Music of the Lord of the Rings, he explains that this theme is meant to explore the simple joy of Hobbiton. We wanted to feel like the hobbits were playing the music, so it has that quality, recalls Shore. Peter would say, make it hobbity. He was always conscious of that human factor. So let's start off by reading a few different descriptions of the Shire itself and what things are in this beautiful place. Now, of course, we have to start with that essential reading from the beginning of The Hobbit. The beginning of it all. In a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. Not a nasty, dirty, wet hole filled with the ends of worms and an oozy smell. Nor yet a dry, bare, sandy hole with nothing in it to sit down on or to eat. It was a hobbit hole, and that means comfort. It had a perfectly round door like a porthole, painted green with a shiny yellow brass knob in the exact middle. The door opened onto a tube-shaped hall like a tunnel, a very comfortable tunnel without smoke with paneled walls and floors tiled and carpeted, provided with polished chairs and lots and lots of pegs for hats and coats. The hobbit was fond of visitors. The tunnel wound on and on, going fairly but not quite straight into the side of the hill. The hill, as all the people for many miles around called it, and many little round doors opened out of it, first on one side and then on another. No going upstairs for a hobbit, Bedrooms, bathrooms, cellars, pantries, lots of these. Wardrobes, he had whole rooms devoted to clothes. Kitchens, dining rooms, all were on the same floor, and indeed, on the same passage. The best rooms were all on the left-hand side, going in, for these were the only ones to have windows, deep-set round windows looking over his gardens and meadows beyond, sloping down the river. All right, a few things to talk about in this reading. The first thing is that that sentence near the beginning, and that means comfort. That really is, in a nutshell, what we're talking about here with the Shire. Bag End is really the embodiment of that hobbity comfort. 
endless pantries, clothes, bedrooms, room for guests, and of course that round door. The ideas that we're going to be looking at for this theme are joy and comfort, simple and plain as they would like it in the Shire. So Tolkien does the careful and particular job of letting us readers know that this is not a hole in the ground like you might first think. He establishes that comfort from the beginning. Another thing to point out is, another thing to point out that happens a good amount in The Hobbit is the description we get with the hill. The hill. Very important, as Sean and Alan actually had a big discussion on in the Prancing Pony podcast. This gives us the idea that the Shire is so small and secluded that there really is only one hill. So to call it the hill, capital T and capital H, makes sense. Same thing happens with across the water. There's only one water that we could be talking about. So that's its name. Nice and simple. I'd like to read next a section from Michael Drought's J.R.R. Tolkien Encyclopedia. Always called the Shire, as Gandalf informs Radagast, this small district in Eriador, in west-central Middle-earth, is home to the beings known as hobbits. It is probably the best-defined geopolitical unit in all of Middle-earth, J.R.R. Tolkien having carefully fashioned its history, geography, and culture. Hobbits inhabit the region later called the Shire from the 11th or 12th century of the Third Age onward. Its first formal grant of territory came in 1601 of the Third Age, from King Argolub II to Marco and Blanco Fallowhide. He granted them 40 leagues in an east-west direction from the Brandywine River to the Far Downs, and 50 leagues in a north-south direction, an original total of 18,000 square miles. In 2340 of the Third Age, hobbits settled in an enclave beyond the Brandywine River, which came to be known as Buckland. Much later, in the Fourth Age, 32, King Elisar granted lands from the Far Downs westward to the Tower Hills, a region designated the West March. At the same time, Buckland became officially the East March, the total area of the Shire is thus about 21,000 square miles. So some people have said that it's just a bit smaller than the state of West Virginia, or just about double the size of Wales. Either way, I live in Canada, and I wouldn't know. But it's home, and it has been to these hobbits for a long time, and pretty little has changed along the way. Let's continue on with another section from the prologue of The Lord of the Rings on the ordering of the Shire. The Shire was divided into four quarters, the farthings already referred to, north, south, east, and west, and these again each into a number of folklands, which still bore the names of some of the old leading families, although by the time of this history, these names were no longer found only in their proper folklands. Nearly all Tooks still lived in Tookland, but that was not true of the other families, such as the Bagginses or the Boffins. Outside the farthings was the east and west marshes, the Buckland, and the west march added to the Shire in Shire Reckoning 1452. Now I have to say that one of the aspects of both the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit movies that you really can't help but be blown away by is the beauty and the reality of the Shire. We really have Alan Lee and John Howe primarily to thank for that. There's this beautiful scene in the appendices of the Fellowship of the Ring DVDs where <laughs> Alan and John go to the location for Hobbiton and they sit down and they open their sketchbooks and they just draw the holes in the doors across the landscape. They see it in front of them. It's really pretty amazing and, and awesome that they caught that on film. So a lot of work went into making the Shire feel like it had been there forever in these films. They actually had a year's worth of build-up time to let the grass and the hedges grow and, and get the sets built and have it all feel and grow naturally over time. So to end things off with this discussion of the Shire, I actually want to go to a reading from A Shadow of the Past, but I hope that you might find some other better keeper soon. But in the meanwhile, it seems that I am a danger, a danger to all that live near me. I cannot keep the ring and stay here. I ought to leave Bag End, leave the Shire, leave everything and go away, he sighed. I should like to save the Shire, if I could, though there have been times that I thought the inhabitants too stupid and dull for words, and have felt that an earthquake or an invasion of dragons might be good for them. But I don't feel like that now. I feel that as long as the Shire lies behind, safe and comfortable, I shall find wandering more bearable. I shall know that somewhere there is a firm foothold, even if my feet cannot stand there. Of course I have sometimes thought of going away, but I imagine that as a kind of a holiday. A series of adventures like Bilbo's are better, ending in peace. But this would mean exile. A flight from danger into danger, drawing it after me, and I suppose I must go alone, if I am to do that and save the Shire. But I feel very small and very uprooted, 
and well desperate. The enemy is so strong and terrible. What a beautiful piece. Frodo's so noble. I love that line. As long as the Shire lies behind, safe and comfortable, I shall find wandering more bearable. I shall know that somewhere there is a firm foothold, even if my feet cannot stand there. That really is what this story is all about. We set out to save the Shire, says Frodo at the end of The Return of the King. So this is what we have at stake, comfort and simple joy. And that's what Shore's emulating in the music. So let's dive into our mid-mark segment and hurry to get back to the details of this theme. So for today's Midmark section, we're going to actually hear a little bit about what Sophie does and uh, kind of what she's been up to, and then we're going to get a chance to listen to some of her music. So I will let her take it away. My name is Sophie Dupuis. I'm a composer, violinist, and music educator from New Brunswick and based in Ottawa. In my composition, I draw inspiration from the idea of contemplation of the self and of nature which is heavily influenced by the environment I grew up in. I'm also drawn to mechanical, electrical sounds from my surrounding. I like to write music for acoustic instruments, small or large ensembles, fixed and live electroacoustics, and interdisciplinary mediums. As a violinist, my interest lies in new music and improv. I recently received my doctorate in music composition from the University of Toronto, and I am vice president of the Canadian League of Composers, a long-standing organization that advocates for all Canadian composers. Awesome. Now let's hear a little bit of our music. Thank you. 
Awesome. All right. Now, I do want to take a quick moment uh, before we get back into things, as always, to let you all know about my Patreon. If you like the podcast and you want to help make it happen or make it better, then go to patreon.com forward slash music of Middle Earth. And if you aren't a part of the Music of Middle Earth podcast group on Facebook, then definitely go check that out and ask to join. We're going to start having bi-weekly get-togethers where we just kind of get together and discuss a scene from the movies and just kind of talk about music for a little while. We had our first one on this past Thursday and it was a lot of fun, so I look forward to doing a lot more of those. And of course, I want to put a special thanks out to our patrons for this episode for helping make it happen. We have Chris in Massachusetts, Bonnie in Washington, and David in Iowa. Thanks so much for helping make this episode happen. All right, now time to dig into this theme. Let's have another listen to Sophie's rendition. So let's talk about the instrumentation first. The theme is primarily played on the violin. We use the violin back in the History of the Ring theme to show antiquity and history. Um, This time we're using it to get that real rural feel, good tilled earth. As Shore says, we're trying to imagine that the hobbits could be playing this music. So it makes sense to use the violin for that cause. It has that slightly kind of folk feel, just like the whistle did, especially when it's played this way. Because the violin has the expressive quality that it does, meaning you can bow fast or slow and that can translate so much emotional intent, we get something that other instruments just can't replicate to the same effect. If you listen to the theme on a piano, for example, you don't quite get the same upbeat, kind of bright sense of energy and joy. Let's listen to what that would sound like. Still nice, but the thing that makes this theme a little less energetic on the piano is the fact that you can't control dynamics while the note is being played. This is something that I'm envious of bowed and woodwind instrument players for. I play bass and guitar mostly, and those instruments, along with the piano, are not able to alter the dynamic or volume intensity of a note as it's being held. You can kind of simulate it with a volume pedal or a knob on your guitar, but it really doesn't have the same effect. So I'll play a version of this theme on my bass without and then with the volume swells so you can hear what I mean and then I'll explain it. So it's kind of a cool sound, but it doesn't have that expressive quality. Basically what I'm doing is I'm turning up the volume, not the intensity. It'd be the equivalent of someone turning up the volume on a microphone when someone's speaking into it. No matter how loud it gets, it's not going to sound like the person is yelling. It won't have the correct intensity. It'll just sound like a very loud, normal speaking voice. So when I use my bass with these volume swells, it kind of really just sounds like me turning up and down the volume instead of turning up and down the intensity. This is why woodwind and especially bowed instruments can do such a great job of recreating the sound of our vocals and getting that emotion out. Let's listen to Sophie play again. Some of the most interesting aspects of this theme are not actually the notes that are being played, but how they're being played. We haven't gotten a chance to talk about rhythm too much with these themes yet, as most of them have been decently steady and flowing. This one, on the other hand, is definitely not. Shore makes use of what we might call offbeats. 
This is another essential aspect of the theme that creates that jolly Sam's just out in the garden kind of feel. In most scenarios with quote-unquote popular music, what we would hear on the radio, things are in what we call 4-4. Four, four. This means there are four beats in every bar or measure. Basically that if we count to four with the music, things will work out and you'll be able to continue and repeat that process of counting to four for the rest of the song. I think most of us are familiar with that concept, so I'm going to move on from it. But again, if you have any questions about any of this stuff, any of the concepts or ideas that we talk about in these podcasts, definitely send me an email um, or a message and, and we can talk more about it. So we have two different types of beats. So we're going to separate things into two different types of beats, downbeats and offbeats. If I clap with the numbers, we get what's called the downbeats. One, two, three, four. If I clap evenly between the numbers, those are called the offbeats. Totally different feeling altogether. One, two, three, four. So if we turn on a metronome and listen to the rural theme, we start to see where things are landing. Some notes will line up with the sound of the metronome, those would be the downbeats, but most of them will be somewhere in between. So let's listen to that. So we get a lot of those notes in between the beats and in between the sound of the metronome. This is really cool as a composer because sometimes it, it's really not about what notes you choose. It's about when you play them or where in time you play them to get a different feel or a different emotion. So now this is interesting. I'm going to play another version of the theme for you. It's going to be the exact same notes, but all on the downbeats instead of the offbeats. Very different and we lose a lot a lot of the kind of joy feeling that comes through it it sounds very straight and organized now when we divide a bar like this with the downbeats and the offbeats instead of just counting to four really we have to count eight different things so we can count one two three four five six seven eight but a lot of the time we switch and we count one and two and three and four and this is called subdividing the bar or measure we had four beats and we subdivided it into smaller sections. We can do that again and get 16 different sections. Really we could go on and on making smaller and smaller kind of subdivisions, but it gets a little crazy when you go past uh, the 16th note. So we're not going to do that, we're just going to stick to this new 16th note subdivision we call it. Just splitting the bar into 16 equal parts. So just like we did with the first two versions, I'm going to take some of those notes and move them onto the 16th note subdivisions. Just like swapping places on a piece of grid paper. Let's see what that sounds like. Again, a totally different feeling this time. It really just shows um, what happens when you move things around in time. A little bit earlier, a little bit later, and it sounds completely different. Important to note though, it's all the same notes though. Just moving this one here and that one there in time. So let's listen to all three different versions. I'm going to play the original, and then the downbeat version, and then the original again, and then finally this 16th note version.
So cool. Now the next thing that we have to talk about is the articulation of the notes in this theme. Articulation, we can describe as how we attack the note, or maybe the attention that we give the note. I'll have Sophie play a few different variations on her violin. So we have legato, where all the notes are long and held and full. And then we have staccato, where the notes are short and abrupt. We heard that in the last episode as well with Rebecca and Mark's playing. So now we also have slurs between notes in this theme. On the violin, this just means that we're playing each of the notes with one bowing motion. So you don't have that kind of start and stop in between the notes. It's just a constant flow. So if you listen to that first phrase, we hear that slur, and it ends with a staccato. Now, if Sophie plays the same phrase, but with the last note not staccato, it doesn't have the same kind of lift that we need. Just really subtle things here that make a difference in a composition or theme. So all of these aspects and elements are combining to give us a really nice theme that provides that uplifting, comforting, rural kind of joy-filled emotion that we need. A couple of quick other things to note about this theme. It and a lot of the other Hobbit Shire themes are all originally in D major. Same scale or key because they usually play off of one another. The next thing I want to mention actually is something that for us to be aware of as we continue through these other Shire themes and actually some of the future themes as well. A lot of them start with these three same ascending notes. Really great way to make sure that we're continuing the same idea through different themes and really through the movies as well. Let's listen to those three and how they play out differently in these first two Shire themes. So we're going to look out for that in the future as well. That's kind of like our, our central ascending musical idea. We'll point it out more as we go. And like we said in the last episode, these first two themes are really designed to make sure that we as the audience know what's at stake for these characters. These themes weave themselves into the beautiful hills and round doors of the Shire and its people. We, and its people, we have to know what they're fighting for. As Gandalf says to Pippin in chapter one of The Return of the King, Minas Tirith. If Gondor falls, or the ring is taken, then the Shire will be no refuge. So that just about wraps it up for another episode of The Music of Middle-Earth. I wanted to say another big thank you to all of you listeners. This show has grown way faster and bigger than I, than I could have expected or hoped for, and we're really only on episode 7. If you want to share what you think of the podcast, then feel free to leave a review on iTunes or on Facebook. Those go a long way to helping uh, to spread the word. Next time we get to dive into the first of five episodes on our cast of Amazing Hobbits, we start, of course, with Mr. Frodo Baggins himself. We're going to be looking at the theme, A Hobbit's Understanding. Let's have a listen to that one now.
excited to talk about this theme and Frodo, as well as that kind of unique Hobbit style of logic and thinking about life. So now finally, if you've listened to the past episode, you will have heard that we have a collaboration video on the way uh, of people playing concerning Hobbits. The deadline for that is actually May 10th, so if you are interested in that, send me a message quickly and uh, we should be able to get your video in still. Um, I'm really excited to release that. So send me an email if you have any questions about music, music theory, instruments, or anything else on your mind, musicofmiddleearthmail at gmail.com. Thank you all so much, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.